Yo, 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 what is going on, COD Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and today I got a hot one for you. We're going to be letting you listen into about 14 minutes worth of recording from one of the DS Diplomacy meetings that we had with them, conversations. Now, the reason these are recorded is to provide transparency to our management team. So those that were in the Nasty Family Management, or if you were a part of management as an R4 or R5, I always recorded these so that way it could be provided to those individuals as an unlisted video so they could be up to date with how things happen. They can listen in on the calls and just be privy to the conversations. So that way we're not hiding anything from anyone. Today, we're gonna let you listen in on a portion of that. And however, it's going to be full context clips. It's not gonna be a bunch of clips that are taken out and strung together. You're gonna hear the full responses uh, and full positions from uh, each side. Now, what we're talking about today is gonna be about zone three and how the PVP should be conducted in there, whether it's free for all, to an extent, or maybe with an asterisk, uh, all the way to organized PvP as far as doing war games. And then, once I let, once you finish listening to it at the end, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to further make valid points and valid arguments that will showcase the kind of what you don't know you don't know, which is to talk about when it comes to specific things such as player psychology, kingdom management, even maybe some areas of alliance management, uh, understanding kind of the needs of players within a kingdom, there is a lack of knowledge and a lack of experience from the DS leadership side. And it doesn't mean that they don't know anything about playing games at all. We're not saying that. But it was specifically about kingdom builders because they themselves have already told us that they did not have a lot of knowledge and experience when it comes to traditional kingdom builders, such as games like Rise of Kingdoms, Infinity Kingdom, Call of Dragons, Lords Mobile, etc. State of Survival. I could, I could go on for days. Uh, mainly because they come from a, a game called Top War, right? And they played in the number one kingdom there, 770, which we'll show you some of those things here in a, bit, uh, a little bit later as well. And so let me let you play, listen to this clip, and then at the end, we'll come back and we'll provide you with some follow-ups, some conclusive thoughts, and we'll show you some more supporting evidence as well. Prior to Season 2, so they can start getting PvP practice, they can start learning more on PvP tactics and pairings and how to do their talents and what to look out for when they're fighting, so we can be as prepared as we can going into Season 2. Because make no mistake, like Croc said, you're going to fight 24-7 in Season 2. And there's going to be players that are going to be just as strong as these, if not maybe stronger than these. Um, again, I haven't scouted all the other six kingdoms that are plus or minus around us yet. But from what I've heard, there are some players that are already around that power level. Um, but again, I'm all for doing things in a way that's going to allow the average player to get the most out of the experience without ever taking a choice away from someone but bearing in mind that anyone can do that already. Like, you know, it, the only difference is, is that you're either saying it's free for all where people can do whatever they want, hit any farmers they want, hit any open field marshes they want versus saying, hey, you guys can do anything you want, but just agree to it beforehand. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the same exact thing and people can do as much PVP as they want. If Bob wanted to, he could put a thing out there and say, hey guys, does anyone want to go in PVP? And if you think about it, that's actually a really good way to test the engagement. If Bob goes out in chat or in world chat and he says, hey, who wants to go? Uh, who wants to PVP me? I'm, I'll be here for the next couple hours. How many people do you think he's going to get responding to him? Short answer, probably not a lot. But why is that? Why wouldn't he get a lot of people that would respond? Well, because a lot of them would view it as them having to punch up. Right, so it kind of goes right back to the same average player psychology standpoint, which is that if you want to get a lot of people to come out and fight, which is what everyone here has been saying to me thus far, is we want to make it fun and we want to get as many people to show up as possible. How do you do that? Well, you create a situation and an environment which is inviting for people to come out and do it because the average player is not going to want to go out there and just get beat up all day long in a pure free-for-all pvp environment i don't really have a say uh i'm sure aziz hq um we'll talk about it later well i'll talk about it later um where i'm at i'm i'm happy to go with what we're talking about here um 
with what you've mentioned. Uh, give it a try. And and we can always adjust from there. Like it's not a permanent thing. This is malleable. It's a game, multiple seasons. We have a long time to do all this. Um, I I believe just still at the main concern is keeping everyone engaged. So, uh, in that regard, I I believe we're all kind of on the same page. But I I, I again I can't speak for them. Okay, so we can like try and keep like. adjusting about the rules in zone three but to be honest with you for zone three we want to have like more bvb you know and that's gonna make make all the people who ask me for to have bvb decide later is that enough for them to have to stop in some point you know many people doesn't play this game before i want them to like figure out and see how the war is affect or how the war is going to damage them so for now i need like zone 3 going to be like free for all everyone can have fight everyone can like attack has his own bvb you know it's like for fun and then we can like as a leader here and we have like okay we know we need to organize thing we get, we need to like make healthy server i need people to see by themselves that zone 3 when when we have a war there is like a good thing and a bad thing i want them to test that to know that so whenever i say we going to build a good server they going to like understand that and definitely agree you understand the point want to do more pvp like i, I think that i think the thing we can all agree on is that yeah is that there's a we understand of that yeah we understand that we, we understand how to run a kingdom we know how to like make a good and healthy server but so, so many people does not like and understand that i want them to taste it i want to to like go on the battlefield and so and see how much it's costing them to like have like you know uh recover or train more troops stuff like that i want to see, to to see that and then whenever we're going to make like better agreement or better like we stop the war for a while they definitely going to understand that why so many people here do not do not like understand everything I need them to test it. I need them to like have fun. I want I just need like better gaming for them. So whenever we decide like guys we're going to stop war at this point, they totally understand the situation. Again, I I want to use what you said because I think what you said was very important. Um uh, where you said you want to give the players options and you want them yeah. to feel the impact of fighting and yeah. and how much they're losing uh, or how much they could yeah. be losing. Um uh, and again I, I completely agree with you there. What I would offer as a another approach is that that has kind of already happened. So and in the example here is if you look at the zone 1 war. Um I saw messages from players on both sides from DS along with players from our few alliances that were there fighting. Uh, I often would hear from some of my players that were talking to some of your players and hearing that man we just need to stop fighting like we're we have hot we have troops in the hospital we're low on resources we need to be able to gather so I I I think we've kind of already proven your point for what you want to test I think we've already done that uh because I've heard this from people on both sides and I've seen screenshots uh from people and players on both sides Um and I think it's great to be able to test that to your point. I think that's something that quite a few players in DS along with quite a few players from our alliances were able to test and were able to see what the impacts were of how detrimental it can be to progression. I think that was I think if we add on to that, we could also say that when we met for the first time, one of the things that HQ mentioned Uh, and I know you mentioned as well during our first talk is that it's just not sustainable to fight all the time 
and that was one of the reasons uh, we met and tried to work on getting a nap agreed to the first time was because there was all this fighting and everyone recognized that it wasn't healthy to fight for that long and that players were burning out either maybe just uh, emotionally from playing or burning out their resources and their troops. Um, so I, I think there has been a tried and true test to that. Um, and, and again, in me saying that would be saying that I think what you're proposing has been tested. And I'm not saying we couldn't go back to try that. However, if I could offer something, I would say I would love, or I should say we would love as a kingdom, an opportunity, again, to what Sam's point and what HQ had mentioned earlier as far as, look, we don't have to be locked into doing something, but I do think it's important that we can try things out so we can see how effective or maybe not effective they may be and then kind of make those adjustments as needed. And in saying that, uh, I would love the opportunity for us to try and do organized PvP going into Zone 3, but still be able to have that, hey, if anyone wants to go and do free-for-all, they can. They just need to agree to it beforehand, and then we'll just have a lot of other PvP events that we'll be doing throughout the week as a way to try this way because we've already tried it that way. Uh, and so for me, I'd love for us to be able to try that so we can show uh, how either great it can be or maybe if it doesn't live up all the way and then we try something else, if that's okay with you. So Blue and HQ, what do you think about that? I I, I kind of agree that uh, we have already done the free-for-all thing by having our war. Uh, and I... and the whole reason for the nap was I, I think you know this better than me was to give our farmers and, and our free to play players and people who couldn't sustain in the war a chance to, to build and sustain um, so I think going into zone 3 if we start out with trying the organized warfare at first um, it wouldn't be a bad option I don't, I don't think it would be negative I, I don't think anyone in our i think i think we could definitely convince our, our our players to try that out first um without any backlash though hq would know better than me uh because i think she knows a lot of our players better than i do and and so do you i'm thinking i don't disagree with what he's saying um I mean, even now, how we do, you can even make it in a sense where, and I know we say free-for-all loosely, but in the sense where tiles are always safe or something like that. But if you want to do the organized going into it to see how it is, that's fine. I am more so on the side of giving the players options to choose how they want to play. That's how I feel about it. I don't, I think they should be able to play how they want to play, at least at this stage in the server. That's how I feel about it. It's not, we're not going to be able to let them do that every single time. Um, and even later in the server, but right now I, I personally would prefer just let them play how they want to play. If we want to put a restriction on tiles so people can still farm, I think that that would be doable. But however you guys want to do it, I'm I'm fine with whatever. We will discuss the like the options with the entire alliance, and I will let you know, guys. Sure. No, and I appreciate. It. I mean, again, that that's all I uh, that's all I can ask for. Um, and, and, and if I can ask as well, Z's, if it would help, um, w would you like for me to write something up that details out how much PVP there would be in, in this proposed example? So um, if maybe seeing something visually may help, and if so, I'm happy to write that up. Uh, yeah, as a leaders here, we always like take everyone opinion about it so i can and 
I can say, guys, we will not have a war. And they will, they will just listen because we trust each other so much. And we, we, we play together for almost three up to four years together. But I like always like to make, make them choice. You guys want to do this or that. I got to give them like five to six options. And I'm going to make them like cho choice between them. And the high vote going to like decide if they like vote for like war. I will let you know it's they if they divide vote for like we're gonna have like a range BVB. I will just let you know, you know. I don't like to like force them to do something for just for me or for my fun. This is how we like deal with things here. So I'm gonna like talk about with them like in long meeting. And let you know, guys, about the, what they decide. Uh, you can write it, and I will just share it with them, and I will let you know. Sure. No. I, again, I, I definitely appreciate the time um, and and the consideration as well. So thank you. Thank you too. All right. All right. All right. So okie dokie, everyone. We're back now. I'm sure there's a lot going through people's heads that you have just finished listening to that almost 14 minutes of what I think was overall really good conversation where there was points that were made on both sides. But the number one thing that we'll talk about first is that, and this will be short, is that they pretty much all agreed to the points that I made, right? No one flat out disagreed, which it would be hard for you to because the points that I made were valid and they were supported by... Uh, historical reference or context because of things that had already transpired in the kingdom, right? So it's kind of hard for them to take a position that says, oh, I flat out disagree with that without them kind of looking ignorant at that point, right? Which I don't believe any of them are. So number one, they agreed uh, with the exception of Z's kind of abstaining, but not disagreeing, right? Number two is that they said they would share uh, the, or sorry, the number two was uh, they said that they would give, provide us the results of the vote and communicate that to us. Uh, number three, which is kind of 2-B, <clears throat> but number three is that they would provide a written explanation or the explanation that I would write up on how the war games would play out so that way players could understand what they're voting for before they vote, right? There's nothing worse than, and, and I say this kindly, than an uninformed voter because if you're uninformed, then you don't really know what you're voting for, Right? So, <clears throat> which is one of the reasons why, and I'll talk about it later, but I don't necessarily vote that often unless I actually do my due diligence and research on things before I go out and vote. So at least that, that's my stance. But let me now show you two things that will clarify this for the people. So the first one is going to be, and we'll switch screens here so you guys can see this. So this is a conversation not a conversation but this is a group chat that we made uh, that i had made after the initial one which is right here uh with the uh hq and, and z's they're no longer in in the chat but i'm going to show you the screenshot which is the most important part is that they used a bot to do a poll and you could see that there's four options here they have complete ffa nothing safe but zone two and one <coughs> um b ffa and there's actually three points i'm going to make here B, FFA, tile safe in zone three. A C, FFA for assigned days with days assigned for healing, no attacking. And then D, organized war in zone three with the server to prepare for season two. So uh, the first point is that this isn't really worded appropriately where it says organized war in zone three with the server to prepare for zone two. Like that's just a very, it's a very nonchalant way of, of wording that for an option. And even though I understand why they worded it that way and kind of where they're going for it, the fact is, is that that needs context, right? Most people, most players, uh, and you, you heard this mentioned from Z's in the clip, which is that he says many people here do not understand everything right or do not understand all of the things that are involved so if they do not understand everything or don't understand all these things that are involved why are we you know giving and bear in mind i i would be okay with this if there was more of a follow-up however just wording it where it's um you know where it's organized war in zone three where you can still fight as much as you want but have fun doing it like even just something to, to that extent i think would have been a little bit better of a title so to speak, than this, only if there was no follow-up, right? 
And bear in mind, they still should have been followed up no matter what, as far as giving some context. So let me now go into point number two, which is, and I'm going to show you a screenshot for this, so bear with me for a moment here. I'm just going to go back and switch this because I want to make sure that I do get the right screen up. I actually ought to leave it blank. Why not? You know, we'll just keep it easy breezy. So here's a screenshot that you're going to see now of a conversation I had with someone that was in DS along with in their Discord. And obviously for uh, anonymity purposes, right, I'm, I'm kind of keeping this blank. But you can see here that where it says, I did give them a proposal and detailed out how it could look before they posted that vote, which I put in our group chat, right? Here's a screenshot of me posting it before they posted the vote in their Discord. Then I even said here, the player responds, yeah, I don't see anything like that anywhere. So this shows me, right? Now, unless they can show me that they posted this, before the vote was posted, that's an entirely different story. I am totally open to that. So if you have it, please provide it. Otherwise, this is someone that has never, that I do not know of, that has ever told me something incorrect or has lied to me thus far. So I'm going to give their word a little bit more stock than I'm going to view it as the unknown or give the unknown stock on the other side more than this. So this person says, yeah, I don't see like anything like that anywhere. So this, this indicates to me that they did not provide this information as they said they would before the vote was taken, right? So if you think about this from a diplomatic standpoint, that would completely nullify, um, or sorry, that would weaken their position, meaning that because they lied and they were not honest or truthful, that should now allow for us, first off, that should really allow for a revote to happen, right? A recount to happen where you nullify that vote, you provide an explanation, you allow for questions to be asked before a vote is taken, and then you retake the vote. That's how you would appropriately handle this type of situation if it was not explained to them beforehand, to the players before they voted. Then we get to probably the next part here for me is that there were multiple, I just want to point this out. When you listen to that conversation, there were multiple moments where there was opportunities and hands being extended by myself and our team when it came to helping out, giving a level of due diligence. And they're just kind of, when you, and I'm talking like when you look at everything overall for this encounter, for this instance, is that it, it's, it's very disappointing. Right, because it comes off as though they just lied, or they misled, or they omitted, whatever words you would like to choose to use. It just is not a way to operate in good faith. And so now we get to one of the other things, which is that right. Z says he wants to run a good server. Uh, others uh, had said right. They, I think he said they understand how to run a kingdom and a good and healthy server. Uh, so. Then we get to this point, the, the kind of, I guess, closer to the end where you end up hearing that the points were made, but they're still going to go and take a vote. Bear in mind, there's only two ways you can approach this, and I'm not faulting them for taking a vote. The two ways you can approach this is that, hey, this person made a good argument and they made good points. Let's sell this now to our players because now we believe it, right? Whereas... We're, either we believe in it or we or we or we believe in this more than we believed in our position right because of the points that were made and so one way to do this is you go and explain that to the players and say look we're going to try this out we're going to test it and if it just doesn't work out then we'll go and we'll try something else easy or you take what i feel is just the lesser of the options and you ca you do a, a vote for everyone the challenge is is that this really wasn't an informed vote this was an uninformed vote which was which provided skewed results because of a lack or a negligence of context and information that was not provided, right? So to me, if you're someone who claims that you run, you know how to run a good kingdom, you know how to run a healthy server, but you lack transparency and or just providing basic information to people so they can be informed before they take a vote. That almost tells me everything I need to know about how you manage a kingdom because your actions are speaking louder than your words right now. So then, let's get to the next part here, which is, right, DS has said before that in their wanting to build a healthy kingdom and etc. right, that they have also done forms of power balancing. 
And this is something that was not mentioned in the clip. This was something that was actually mentioned during our very first meeting, which we had, you know, like 60, uh, a few of them had come in. I think it was Z's and HQ and maybe some others that had came into the Discord. And we had a big chat during a big uh, call, voice call, where we had maybe 60, 70 people that joined. They just, they came in, went in the lounge, we joined them. uh, And we just had a bunch of people that were piling in after. During this time, there was a mention of how they go about, and I think this was also clarified during our second meeting with them as well is you know you know talking about power balancing and they said that they do a form of that however they do it through migration recruitment right so they'll have players that are being uh, recruited in coming through migration for other kingdoms and then they'll kind of appropriately disperse i'm also going to show you a screenshot now and the screenshot is going to show you that and this is from their kingdom in uh, top war i like to do my due diligence and you can see here that their top three alliances are all pretty close in power. Now, it was also explained to me, and I'm going to give this as an additional add-on here, is it was explained to me that at, well, at the time the screenshot was taken, they were in some type of KVK or SVS, so they had consolidated their power to the top three alliances. Again, that's what I was told by one of their members of management. So if that's the case, then one, it still proves the point because they didn't have to power balance for these three alliances. They could have just put everyone into the top one alliance they could have spread it out where they put everyone in the top one then just dispersed it two and three they could have done 13 million power for number one and then had two and three be even but no they actively chose to have some form of power balancing whether they're fighting or not and so this just goes to show you that in their kingdom they believe however much that power balancing helps and it's a factor however If we currently look, and I'm just going to show you this, if we currently look at the leaderboards, you can see that the power balance is not really happening at all. Even though this was explained to them on how the power balancing would work. And I'm not saying, let me point something out, I'm not saying that power balancing is going to be perfect, right? Because in, in, in COD, it is much more difficult to do it than it is in Rock and other games and other kingdom builders, traditional kingdom builders. But if you looked at the boards in previous videos that I showed before you're looking at it now, you would notice and see that the power balance, that the balance of power is a lot closer than it is now. Currently, it's only getting wider, right? And basically, they're turning into a mega alliance, which is something that they didn't, that they recognized was not a good thing in our meetings. So this is probably the second really big point that we're talking about which is them doing things that go against what they were doing in their home kingdom and then also what they preached about not only in parts of what you heard in the video recording but also from what they've told us themselves and then we get to i think the third point and this is the one that's probably going to be just i mean again they're all nails in a coffin because again i if i'm going to make a point i like to at least do my due diligence and my research before i I speak on something at least i'd like to try and do that in, in all cases if not at minimum most so The third point here that we're going to touch on is that let's now look at what's happening in zone three. So bear in mind, let's go off of that vote, right? So you had on two sides, one side is a group of people that were, that were wanting to do organized PVP and the other side wanted to do free for all PVP. So at the moment, and I'm going to show you, give me one, give me one sec here. And I'm going to show you something that I have to get this other screenshot ready. One moment here. And I'm going to show you this. This was a uh, announcement that was made and i'm just going to take a uh man i guess for the moment it doesn't really matter let me just do let me just do this okay so i'm going to take a screenshot now that was made that was taken and again just because i want it to be done in an official capacity so this was posted on the new kingdom 65 discord right for everyone to see that's there These were the current rules going into Zone 3 and just for some other things in the kingdom, right? And we're going to tie all this in. So it says, server rules currently in place. Zone 3 is war uh, war day every day in Zone 3 as it will be a fight for the dragon. War every day. Only rule in Zone 3 is no city hits. Once dragon is taken, we can work on the logistics on who will actually get into what member. So let's pause here. Do you remember the thing that HQ said in the meeting where her view and bear bear in mind i've mainly been speaking with her and then second most would be z's uh mubin's been there a little bit so shout out to him also with sam being there but her position was she understood she didn't disagree but she just offered 
another alternative, which was fine, which was, again, right, doing fighting, but you're like, no, no farm hits, no tile hits. This was obviously something, and bear in mind, she's one person, she doesn't say or speak for everyone, but I, but this is the thing I'm going to say about HQ, and I loved her position on this, because you have to understand where she was coming from when she said something like no tile hits. By her saying no tile hits, she recognizes, right, like really think about the deeper meaning here. She understood and, and to an extent, really believes in what she's saying, which is that understanding that, yeah, fighting all the time and not allowing for p people to grow, it can be extremely detrimental to kingdom development and growth. So by saying, by recommending something like no tile hits, she speaks to that, which is understanding that if regardless of what zone it is, allowing for people to gather is drastically important to them powering up their account so they can be that much stronger if you want to try and fight as a unified kingdom or however much unified when you get into the, the merge season, right? So it's something that was spoken to, but it wasn't executed here, unfortunately. And then you get zone one will be saved, zone two will be saved, zone three war. Anyone caught breaking rules for the first time will pay double the hospital bill and second offense, <clears throat> they will be removed and blocked by all of our members. However, those players would obviously have to join those alliances to get the money back uh, by all our alliances who have agreed to these rules. Uh, but again, it doesn't say, blocked by all of our, right, it doesn't say, and again, this is an assumption, but it would have been nice for this to say which, which of the alliances actually agreed to these rules, right? Because that doesn't say here. Uh, number three, no rallying passes in zone one, two, or three. Uh, this is meant to be a safe space for alliances that want to farm in the, in those areas, so rallying passes are off limits. No toxicity in chat. We want to build a respectful kingdom. First off, I just wouldn't have said no toxicity in chat because anytime you tell people not to do something, uh, well, sometimes I should say when you tell people not to do something, yeah, hang on, sweetie, I'll be right there, and I get it. Uh, when you tell people not to do something like this, which is kind of silencing their voice, right, or their their right to speak, uh, by telling them like you're going to do these and then you're going to get reported or whatnot and you'll be removed. At least when you're doing it in this type of a way where it just comes off a little bit more aggressive, it just doesn't it doesn't really sell the the point that you're trying to make. It's usually better to tell people, look, this is something that is not the best thing to do when it comes to how you speak to other people. And this is these are some of the things that can happen if those players or if a player decides to speak in this manner. And then that will be something that we would address and speak to the individuals with one-on-one. -on -one. And then if we need to escalate it at that point, we will. And this is what we'll do appropriately. Instead of just saying no toxicity in chat, I just would have worded this differently. Hang on, let me finish. Wait, please. Um, and then the last one is if an R5 or R4 breaks any of the following rules, then personally will automatically be removed from power so they are not just a normal player. This this is interesting to me that they said this here because if you remember in my previous video I had a meeting with the council group and one of the things I had said to them is based on how things are currently looking it to me feels like the most uh, highest percentage option of going forward would be to replace the current leaders and then have new leaders come in so we can kind of start over from scratch um, when it comes to the top down level of structure and then those leads can either you know take up an officer or member position here however also being open to an alternative which would be what you know if we were to continue with the current leaders in place right we would need to have people kind of agree to things and almost realign themselves almost kind of like you're redoing your marriage proposal so to speak or your vows uh, which was something that they did uh, and obviously we talked about that in another video it just unfortunately didn't last as long as they probably hoped or thought it would on their part <laughs> uh but this is interesting that it says this because if any are right but this is one of those things where it's this is this is hard because you're setting such high expectations when you say when you say something like this that's as broad as this is, and then if that doesn't happen, this post in a in a, in a way, and the person who's saying this, and, and obviously for those that that the individual speaks for, kind of loses its value, right? It loses its integrity because if people decide to do that, remember how are you going to remove them from power unless they decide to transfer leadership themselves? So that's why you should never come off as though you're going to be able to do this. And that was one of the biggest, well, that, that was a big mistake here by this post is that when I have ever spoken, because I have spoken to this about management when it comes to leaders, and the thing I've always said is that, the thing I've always said is that you, like leaders, leaders have to know and they have to believe in what something, uh, in, in what is happening and what is going on to where if something really bad like that happens, 
they have to be the ones to recognize that and then also agree and understand that, look, if these things happen, they will remove themselves. But the challenge is, is that that may not always happen. Some people might be greedy. Some people probably drank the Kool-Aid and just don't want to give up lead. So that's why you have to go in with a realistic level of expectation. And I just would have never said something like this because that kind of sets you up to fail. Uh, and then the very last thing, right, I'm going to show you now um, is that, well, let's show off zone three. So this is the next thing here. So we're going to show off zone three. And wait, please, I'm almost done. And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how zone three looks now. And that if you see where you have DS, where you have DS and DS3, right? So you have here in orange, you have DS1. In the teal color, you have DS3. And look at how the map looks, right? Which is that they basically have all the territory because of the war. They've pushed sort back here. You have EXN here, but again, they're not doing any attacking, which is interesting to me. I just want to point this out. Like, if I'm looking at this visually, the one alliance here that has the most amount of territory in Zone 3 that is not a part of DS is EXN, right? Sorp doesn't have anything at the moment, uh, you have a TO who's getting their territory pushed back a bit, or at least was. I don't know if they still are. We'll have to see here. I don't think anyone's being hit or not. But they don't have that much territory. Doesn't look like they're connected to any behemoths, so who knows if they're even going to get one. And then you have EXN here, who has, what, triple, four times the territory that any other non-DS family has, and they're also encircling a Magma Daemon? This is interesting to me because I'm, if I'm looking at this objectively, it almost feels to me that maybe they had some type of conversation with DS. Maybe it was a nab. Now, bear in mind, there's precedent here if that happened because they've done this before, which was from the leader trip. She went to them and made basically a secret nap agreement and then later told me that it was already made. And... Uh, this wasn't something that was like said. It, it, again, bear in mind that there was, and this was done over here in Nivola, where it wasn't just her alliance, but it was also uh, Asteria's alliance that was here as well, right? So you had two alliances, but technically three, if you also consider that NWO Crocs alliance was also within firing range from DS, right? But it was only one alliance that went to the DS leadership and made this like secret negotiation pact with them to basically say, hey, look, just don't attack us, but you can attack other people. That to me is very sketchy and suspect. And if I'm looking at the zone three area again, for what it looks like at face value, this is interesting to me on why EXN has as much territory as they do, way more than any other alliance. They're not getting attacked, and they're also around a behemoth, which is two big points here. This leads me to believe that if I'm going down what could be the highest percentage route is, did they? That's a valid question. Did they, did they go and speak to DS and have and maybe make another secret type agreement because of how the map looks, which anyone who knows the history in 65... Could and, and knows of that, or sorry, that would know of this specifically happening, could then look at this, or even if you don't know the history, like just the fact that this wouldn't bring up any questions for you, is again, it is very suspect. So this leads me to, to then my last and final point here, which is that if you look at how Zone 3 is playing out, no one's really fighting anymore. Like, think about how long the fighting lasted. A couple days it lasted. And now what? You're not going to get any more PvP. Why? Because no one's want to. No one is going to want to go out and do free for all PvP where they're constantly having to punch up because you just have the big bad wolf that's going around Zone Three and just waiting for the little minnows or the sheep to come in so you can take your bite out. And this is exactly what I said to them would happen. And it may not have been specifically in that clip, but in other meetings, this is what I said would happen. And I told them, predicted the future, and guess what? It did happen. So the challenge here is that what are they going to do going forward, right? Because are they going to expand from Zone 3 and tell their players, hey, you can go start attacking Zone 2 people, right? Because at that point, you, at that point you're drunk on the Kool-Aid. Right. So, you know, if you're just beholden to your players and there's no true direction and leadership from DS on being able to kind of make those decisions at the top, disseminate it. Remember, Zs himself said that if he makes a decision, his players will follow. Right. That's another argument on why do you necessarily need to do a vote in those in those cases, especially if good points are being made. Right. It kind of 
det- it deters the need for really ha- having to have that type of vote because you agreed and or did not or did not disagree with the points that were being made. Uh, right. And so and but then again, you look at how the vote played out and just how unfortunate it was that the players were completely uninformed before they voted. So this to me, I think, just shows a few things here in my conclusive thoughts. One is that DS leadership isn't as well put together as they come off when it comes to their level of due diligence, how they go about informing their players, the some areas you could argue of general management. Uh, Because that's just not how managers should act. Like if you're at a job and you're managing a group of people, you do not have them take a vote or ask for their opinions on things when they're not informed of what the of what the options are to vote. That just doesn't make any sense. Right. Unless you're doing it in an ill intended way because you want to skew the votes on purpose because you're doing it where you want to shape your own narrative and basically lead to the outcome that you want, which, again, I could make that argument here for what DSs did. I could say that they did this intentionally. They did not share the information on purpose because they just wanted to have a zone three war, even though the points I made were valid, which would just come off as them contradicting themselves at that point, almost being hypocritical. Why are you going to vocally and publicly vote, say that, yeah, you know what, you're making good points, I agree with it, but then you're going to do the complete opposite. Again, this is one of those things that, to really say a kind of a wrapped up version, this is how kingdoms die. This is how people get into a position of power. They've drunk the Kool-Aid, but they do not understand the magnitude, nor do they have the responsibility and probably even the accountability on what is really in the best interest of the players and of a kingdom. And this is where you're trying to kind of, and again, I'm going to say this humbly because I've been told this by multiple people and I just know like the grass is not always greener on the other side. And you might be trying to be you know, someone that you're not or trying to do something that you just do not have the capacity to do in that moment. And I think you're really seeing a lot of those chinks and the cracks in their armor when it comes to the DS, specifically DS1, where they are doing things in a way where they truly do not understand how players are going to react for those specific things. And you're seeing that play out exactly right now, where Really, the only way to kind of salvage a situation would almost be going to some type of a war games environment. Because anytime you do some type of free-for-all PvP, even if you only do it on weekends or you do it one or two days a week, you're still always going to put yourself in a position where the strongest players are punching down and the ones who are not the strongest are punching up. And they're just going to feel hunted. Why would anyone go out in Zone 3 to fight if they know that there's such an overwhelming disadvantage? I mean, even if you didn't just go out and fight, look at the leaderboards. For Pete's sake, why are you, why are, why would players want to go out from any of these other alliances when there's such a disparity in power here? It just makes no sense. Like that to me is a turnoff. Why would I want to go out and fight, even if we're doing something organized where the power disparity is so great that even if we did go out and fight in these fun organized war games, it would still be such a resounding advantage to the number one alliance? Again, this is why it's important to understand how things play out in certain games. And my word of advice for DS is this. Before you try to manage something, before you try and take on more than you can chew, at least have the professional courtesy to educate yourself in all of the facets of something before you go into it. And I'll give you a brief history here on how that's exactly what I did. When I first started playing Kingdom Builders, My initial first thought was, oh, hey, I'm not going to go try to manage this kingdom. No, it was I need to learn the game. I need to ask questions. I need to strive for knowledge. I need to go and see how other kingdoms are being built. I have hundreds of accounts in Rock. I have almost 150, 175 accounts, about 200 in Infinity Kingdom. And then I have 120 or however many in COD. And the whole reason for that was because I wanted to go out and scout how other kingdoms operate. I wanted to read their king's mails. I wanted to ask questions for leaders or officers or ask questions in world chat. I wanted to see how they played out certain situations. How did they develop their zone three? How did they do their territory? Okay, what were the power levels? Who power balanced and who didn't power balance? And then what were the after effects or the ripples, right? What happened from doing those things? And this just covers a little bit. But, and then I also worked my time as a member to see what, how can I be a contributing member? I did my time as an officer. How can I be a contributing officer? I did my time as a leader. How can I be a contributing leader? And then before, and then I had to do all of that and more 
to eventually get to a point where I thought, you know what, now I have a baseline, a good level of knowledge and experience, and I'm coming in with hopefully a level of uh, maturity that speaks to uh, that, that type of Switzerland neutral tone approach that you should have, in my opinion, as a lead, and kind of cool, calm, and collected. And then I thought, okay, now I feel like I'm ready to start trying this out. And that is something that is such a minority, like you're not going to have the majority of people, like I'm talking, that's such a minority where you're basically a bunch of Gilligans on an island for the amount of people that are really in positions that have done all of that, or even just some of it, even just at a bare minimum, to where you've collected all of this. And then you can tell yourself, you know, now I think I'm ready to go and try this. And I just don't think that any of their players in leadership and management have done that only because they've expressed to us that they haven't played or haven't, let me, let me be specific here. They haven't done these types of management details or positions in traditional kingdom builders where they have done up to, or even most of what I've just mentioned. And that is really, if you're, if you really wanted to strip everything down, that's probably the biggest point to make, which is why are you trying to do something that you don't have a full understanding of how to do? And unfortunately, this is something that plagues kingdom builders. If I'm making a bigger, even a bigger, bigger point here, which is speaking more to the broad genre of what we're playing, is that this is something that you will often see happen at the leadership level of leaders that are leading alliances when they don't have enough of an understanding on how to go about doing that. And then greater than that, trying to lead multiple alliances or trying to be king or queen of a kingdom, and you're... You, don't, you just don't know what you don't know because you don't have enough time put in to really understand what you're doing. So, again, I, I, think, Z, I think Z's and HQ and, and Mubin and, and Sam and, and the others I've talked to, they, they all come off as nice people, right? Nothing against them personally. We're talking about specific decisions that are being made in a game where your decisions are impacting the average player's playability, enjoyment, their experience, which can cause them either to keep playing, to leave, and migrate, or restart their account, or quit the game entirely, which affects the bottom line, or the bottom dollar, of the developers. Everything's connected, right? So, anyways, that is my spiel. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Let me know in the comments below. I wasn't expecting for this video to be this long, but I do hope that you, and even if you listen to it as a podcast, I hope that you enjoy the full context that was provided here. And how it's important to go into situations with a cool, calm, and collected mindset along with really just a level of professional courtesy and due diligence. So that's going to do it for me. As always, until next time, I will catch you later.